Ten of the Republic is a really rich and interesting book uh, in which most of the themes uh, from the Republic come up again and are uh, dealt with in uh, interesting and sort of subtle ways. Uh, there's no way that I can talk through all of that stuff. So I'm going to begin by talking about the discussion of art that uh, the book begins with, uh, especially in relationship to the theme of mimesis that was introduced back in book three. And then I'll talk about the story of Ur, uh, with which book 10 ends. So Socrates begins by asking Glaucon, who is uh, his only interlocutor in book 10, uh, by asking Glaucon about uh, the nature of mimesis. He says, could you tell me what mimesis in general is? So that's the, the question of the as such, right? What does it mean for something to be a mimesis? Uh, so you remember mimesis is something we've talked about quite a bit already. We talked about it in book three when we talked about uh, imitative poetry. Right? We talked about uh, that kind of writing that instead of saying he said that makes it look as if the person is actually speaking. And so that's the thing you especially see in drama. Right? Uh, and then we talked about it again in a different but related context uh, in when we talked about book five and book six when we talked about uh, the nature of things that come into being and pass away corresponding with talking about the issue of the as such we talked about those things that realize uh, or make something that is present and drawing on the language of uh, the divided the image of the divided line in book six of the republic we called those things that that make some identity present, uh, mimesis, reenactments was the way I was translating it, or, uh, or presentation, make, making, ways of making present. Um, so yeah, mimesis is a word that's, you know, translated as, as imitation, which is okay, but I've been trying to bring out these other sides of it by looking at those particular examples and seeing what it means. Uh, and so uh, Socrates now asks, you know, well, what is that as such? Uh, so why do you ask that? Well, you ask that when you've been meaningfully using that notion but in different contexts and you want to sort of figure out like what what is it of which these different things are all you know kinds of realization right and so you know it's one thing to talk about it in the context of dramatic poetry it's something else to talk about it in the context of a tomato plant or you know an animal growing up or again to talk about it in the context of a a circle or the number one which is a, another place where we talked about it quite a bit uh, so it makes sense that you'd want to say okay we've seen that structure of the, or that reality of mimesis happening in all these places well let's try to understand more deeply you know from out of its possibility from out of the very nature of reality what that is right that's that's the kind of question that's being asked and indeed he says for I myself uh, scarcely comprehend what it wants to be. Uh, right? That's again exactly the language we used in the kind of metaphysical context of talking about, you know, a stage of the plant's life or a stage of the animal's life. You know, what, what it's trying to do is trying to be a plant, right? Or when we talked about the polis, we said, you know, any polis is a polis to the extent that it's realizing that idea of what it is to be a polis. Right, that certain kind of fulfillment of human need. And so there's a basic way that when you define what it is to be that thing, you're defining also the norm that it answers to. So you're defining what any particular sort of realization of it is in, is in a way trying to be, right? And so that's exactly the language that Socrates then uses here. And sure enough, the very next thing he says is, shouldn't we follow our usual procedure uh, for we are presumably accustomed to set down some one particular uh, ADOS, some one, one particular form, for each of the particular manys to which we apply the same name. Right? So that's the, the, the thing that they, you know, it's a sort of shorthand for the thing that we were talking about before, especially it came up at the end of the book five when he talked about beauty and the good and so on. That's a sort of shorthand for this thing I've just been talking about, about the way from uh, a kind of reality that sort of appears in multiple ways, we try to grasp the essence of that, what it is to be that thing. 
Uh, so that seems completely straightforward. But then it takes a sort of a funny twist. So right after that, at 596b, uh, or a and b, um, is the, they're going to talk about this. And so Socrates says, okay, well, now let's set down any one of the manys you please. Um, so first of all, why would we do that? So he says we're going to follow our usual method, and we want to know what mimesis as such is. So the normal way to think of the relationship between those two remarks is we want to figure out what it is to be mimesis. So we're going to go from the many kinds of mimesis to try to figure out what, what it is in the nature of reality of which those things are so many realizations. In fact, they are going to do that in the long run. But that's not the way the conversation goes, right? In place of that, which is what you would expect on reading this, Socrates says, oh, okay, let's just do that. Give me give me a many and let's try to find a one for it. You know, and so Glaucon goes for that. In this section in general, you know, it's one of the, another one of those places in the Republic that stands out for Glaucon's really, really bad answers. Once again, it seems like Glaucon says the wrong thing at every turn. Uh, but, you know, Socrates finds ways to correct that. But... Uh, Glocon seems not to be very uh, connected with these issues. Um, anyway, so Socrates says, uh, okay, let's set down any one of the many's you please. For example, if you wish, uh, you know, so it's like he's saying to Glocon, you can do it, but then he proposes one. He says, uh, surely there are many couches and tables. Um, well, that's a really unfortunate example. Um, you know, though, the, precisely what we were learning when we were talking about this is that that notion of mimesis and form all the things we were talking about the, those are the ways you talk about phusis right the, what socrates has been exploring are the constitutive dimensions of what it is for something to occur as a naturally existing being right that's that's what his study has been articulating uh, and, you know, we do talk about the polis, which is a thing that human beings have to bring into being. But precisely what it was to understand the polis was to understand it as something that comes from human nature. It's only when you do that that you are able to make sense of it, right, to understand it in its being. Right? And so to, to suddenly give his, as an example, these... Um, artificial things is is a is a remarkably bad choice again there's a reason for it in terms of what socrates actually wants to get at but socrates isn't revealing that reason yet and the reason that the conversation is taking the form it is is because glaucon is kind of clueless um but anyway that's what they're gonna do so glaucon says yeah go for it and socrates says okay but as for ideas of these uh furnishings uh they're presumably two one of coach one of table well, okay, Socrates just gave you the answer. What is the one that relates to the many of coach and table? Furnishings, right? You, you, you only understand what it is to be a coach and what it is to be a table if you understand them as ways of realizing the need to furnish. And that in turn, you would have to trace back to what it is that human beings do, right? Couches and tables are ways of fulfilling a certain kind of human need to make uh, an appropriate environment for themselves that, that fits their goals, their desires, and their needs in that way, just like the polis was, right? They're part of the human need to build a human environment because a proper human environment doesn't occur by nature. It's required by our nature, but we have to make it, and that's that's. That is the human condition. And that's what, uh, in another context, uh, Protagoras talked about. In, in this great speech he gives in Plato's dialogue, Protagoras, he, you know, he says, like, that's, that's the human condition. The rest of nature uh, comes into being with sort of organism and environment in a natural relationship of fit. Actually, it's basically the same issue we talked about throughout this book when we were talking about justice and, and fit. Um, but... Uh, he says the thing about the human being is human beings uh, come into being ill-equipped to match their environment. There isn't a natural fit, and so the thing about human beings is that we have to build for ourselves our own environment. And that, he says, is what the techni are, right? Human arts are the things humans develop 
to make it be the case that they can function in the natural world, right? So that's the same thing we've been saying, and, you know, that's the correct answer to the question of what is the one you'd have to find to understand couches and tables. Couches and tables are examples of furnishings, which are examples of the human need to make an environment for themselves, and so that's taking you back to human nature, right? But that's, of course, not the direction the conversation goes. Uh, Saki says, okay, for ideas for these things, he says, surely there are two, one for couch and one for table. Uh, that's an unfortunate, unfortunate turn. And of course, Glaucon says, yes. Uh, but then, then Socrates says, um, okay, wouldn't we also say that it's in, in looking to that idea of, of each of these furnishings, uh, you know, he keeps underlining that, um, that one craftsman makes the couches and another the chairs that we use, and similarly for other things, right? It's based on sort of grasping that that you're going to make these things. And then he says, for presumably none of the craftsmen fabricates the idea itself. I mean, again, uh, just a nasty bit of confusion. If they had been rightly analyzing this in the terms that they had set out in the dialogue so far, that would be the right thing to say. Because no craftsman made human nature. No craftsman made the need for human beings to build furnishings. So in that sense, it would be true to say that anybody uh, who makes those things uh, is turn has to be turning to a kind of insight into something uh, more basic, something something natural. But that's, of course, not the route they went. When they w went the route they did, where they sort of treated the couch as a kind of uh, independent kind of reality and the table as a kind of independent sort of naturally occurring reality, th they went in the direction of artifice. And in that context, of course people make those things up. That, that's exactly where they come from. S somebody did figure out, hey, let's make a couch. Let's make it like this. Somebody figured out, hey, let's make a table, let's make it like this. And we invent those things all the time, right? So artificial things are exactly the, the kind of thing that comes from people fabricating the ideas themselves. So, so they kind of have two choices, right? Either they had to analyze the sort of notion of the species or the essence better, in which case it would have been right for them to say the craftsman doesn't fabricate the idea. Or if they're going to go with the route they took of focusing on these artificial things in, in distinction from and in ignorance of their relationship to nature, well, then they have to say that the craftsman does make up the idea. Right? So, you know, we could go on about this, but there, there's just um, uh, uh, Glaucon uh, is clearly uh, is not adept at dealing with any of these philosophical issues that are raised in these things that, that we've been studying all through the book. Right? Uh, but so then Socrates turns around and sorts that out pretty quickly and starts to make the distinctions that Glaucon should have made and failed to make. So, but, so what Socrates says is, oh, I'm going to tell you about this clever craftsman who can make everything that everybody makes. And we're going to go talk about that in a minute. Uh, but I just mentioned that now to get into the next sentence because he says... Um, for this uh, manual artisan, Chirotechnes, um, is not only able to make all implements, furnishings, that same word again, skew uh, but also makes everything that grows naturally from the earth, and he produces all animals, the others and himself too, and in addition to that produces earth and heaven and gods and everything in heaven and everything in Hades under the earth. So... Glaucon's approach to the conversation with Socrates has really been to take things that need to be carefully distinguished and just collapse them into a kind of uniform mess. So Socrates here draws the distinctions, right? He, these are the things you need to be able to recognize. You need to be able to distinguish um, the, the world of, you know, the heavens and the earth, and then, you know, whatever, whatever the gods are that are, that are uh, so far as they relate to that. Uh, you need to be able to recognize the things, the naturally occurring beings, right? Plants that grow out of the earth, animals, people. And then within that context, you need to think about implements, right? So Socrates kind of, you know, quickly sketches out here correctly uh, something like the great chain of being, right? He quickly sketches out like the, the kinds of realities that make up the world of nature, basically, that we have to be able to recognize and distinguish and that we have been talking about all along. 
Um, and then, uh, a little bit later, he's then going to uh, draw a distinction between uh, the source of the furnishings and other artificial things like that and the source of those things, that plants and animals and so on. And he's going to say, you know, uh, those things like, but let's just say the world of nature in general, those things, uh, we're not going to say that some person made those. We're going to say, if anything, you know, that's the work of a god. And he also then calls that that being, you know, whatever it is, wherever these things come from, he's going to call that the futurgos, the, the nature begetter, as uh, Bloom translates it. So he's he is zeroing in on the artifice and its distinction from the natural world in a way that Glaucon was failing to do. So he's going to say, yeah, uh, unlike all that stuff that happens in nature, people can make things. And that person who makes things, we'll call that guy the, the demiurge um, or the craftsman. And that's not to be confused with what we would call a god or a food or goss. Um, they don't go into more details about that here. I mean, there's plenty of stuff that we've already talked about that goes a long way to make sense of those things. Um, but I'm not going to talk about those things further either. Uh, I just want to, you know, help help you sort out the text here. But anyway, where does that go? Okay, so Socrates, remember, was asking what is mimesis in general, mimesis as such. And the reason he was asking this was to get to that point where he could say, hey, don't you see that there's a person who can make everything? And... Um, Glaucon's like, what, what are you talking about? And, he, and so then the first thing Socrates says at 596D is, oh, I mean, look, here's an easy example. You'll see what I mean. Just hold up an, a mirror and suddenly you've made everything. You'll have all the plants and the animals and the people and everything else right there in your mirror. And uh, so Glaucon gets that. And then Socrates says, and uh, that's what the painter is like. The painter is similarly someone who can, you know, give you a horse and give you trees and give you whatever else right and uh, Glaucon gets that and so that's the person then that he's been referring to who can make everything so the reason he's had this conversation is to get to that point because that both the mirror as I'm going to discuss in a moment and the painter th those are the realities that put in front of us mimesis in a particularly profound way and so indeed he distinguishes the food urgos, the nature begetter, whatever it is that is the source of nature, from the thing we're familiar with, a person who makes stuff, the, the craftsman and the artificial things thus created. And then there's this third, the person who, you know, in everyday language, makes images of those things, right? Um, uh, so he has already referred to that person as a kind of craftsman. And you can see the connection. Of course, it's a person who does something. But should the kind of making that a painter does be treated as the same kind of making that a carpenter does? Uh, and, you know, you can see why you would start off by thinking they're similar, because it's a person doing something and making something. So it makes sense in a way to call them both demiurges or, or uh, artisans. Uh, but on the other hand, the, you know, the, the carpenter makes you a real chair. The uh, painter makes you an image of a chair. They don't, they don't seem like they're making quite the same kind of thing. And so that's what Socrates asks uh, Glaucon. And Glaucon says, no, no, they're not the same thing at all. And he says, uh, and this is at 597E, in my opinion, he, the painter, would most sensibly be addressed as a mimetes. Um, if we stick with the translation here, an imitator. But, you know, I've already told you, I don't think that's a very excellent translation. But a mimetes of that of which these others are craftsmen. So I just wanted to get you to that point so that you can then see this distinction of the futurgos, the demiurgos, and the imitator. And the point is, this conversation is being used to kind of zero in on the distinctive thing that's being done by the painter. Uh, and the image Socrates used, or the thing Socrates drew on to get you into that, was this notion of the mirror. So I want to talk now just a little bit about the mirror, and then go on to talk about the painter. 
so the thing about the mirror right is that you take this piece of i guess you know glass with a certain kind of black background or something and you hold it up and as he says um, if you're willing to take a mirror and carry it around everywhere quickly you will make the sun and the things in heaven quickly the earth quickly yourself and other animals and implements and plants and everything else we just mentioned right so it's an amazing thing about the mirror so you take a piece of glass and black metal or whatever and you get a reflection of everything and that's you know where our discussion of the divided line in book six really began with the way that things are reflected in water or even you know shadows are are a version of that right the way there is a disposition of light on the ground or on the wall that effectively is a representation or a reflection of another kind of reality that's causing it so the thing i want you to notice about that is that there's something going on in reality whether or not you notice it and that is that things are appearing and things are reflecting right the the ground and the light automatically produce a reflection are a reflection of the things going on in the world around them right in shadows and so on the water automatically reflects these things right so um the mirror is this amazing phenomenon that shows you something about the nature of reality as such right it's in the nature of reality that things are always reflecting other things things are appearing and things are reflecting but now you know when we talked about the shadow in book six uh, the thing that we were emphasizing was what it takes for you for a person to see a shadow as a shadow right simply to notice that there is a disposition of light and darkness on a surface is not to see a shadow it's to see light and darkness on a surface you see it as a shadow when you see it as caused by something else that is to say when you see it as the image of someone right and so there we looked at the cognitive or sort of epistemological dimensions of experience of the soul that have to be there for there to be an experience of the shadow but here we're we're kind of looking at uh, the flip side of that we're kind of looking at the uh, metaphysical side of that right we're seeing that there can be an experience of a shadow only because it's in the nature of reality that reality is this process of appearing and reflecting appearing sort of to itself and reflecting itself right so mirrors water uh shadows right those are all so many ways that this structure of reality reflecting itself reality appearing is always taking place but now of course the, the really striking thing is that's always happening but that fact about reality is uh it stands in a pretty unique relationship to the experience of perception right without somebody to see it, it it's kind of like an appearing that never quite got to appearance right it's kind of like the forest is sort of appearing to the lake but you know the lake doesn't notice that the the water surface of the lake is producing this reflection but it's not reflecting it for the trees it's not reflecting it for itself or at least not in the way that it's, anything is noticing so the amazing thing about us is that we do see things right uh people appear to us trees appear to us all kinds of things appear to us right so the the simple fact of isthesis the simple fact of perceiving the simple fact of our of us being aware is kind of like being on the inside of what it is to be a mirror right the the very nature of our experiencing is that we kind of participate in and are, are present at that very structure 
that's going on between things in reality all the time. So the thing about the mirror, the, the example of the mirror, it seems to me, that is so striking is that it starts to draw our attention to that fact of appearing and the fact of a perspective. Uh, and that, in fact, is exactly what he's then going to go on to talk about. At 598A, Socrates says, uh, hey, you know, does, does a couch, if you observe it from the side or from the front or from anywhere else, differ at all from itself? Or does it not differ at all, but only appear different? And similarly with the rest. Right, so he's saying, you know, think about what happens in our experience. You see a couch from over there. You see a couch from over there. You see a couch from over there, right? In every case, your experience of the thing, the way the thing appears to you is uh, from the side, from the front, or you know, from above, from below, right? There, there's no other way you can observe it. But from all those different perceptions, the couch is staying the same. So you see something that is one and the same through different perspectives that are themselves different from one another. But the striking thing about your experience, which is you know, closely analogous to what we were saying before about what it is for a dog to be a dog or the way a dog exists, the striking thing is that you see the same couch, right? The only reason that you can answer this question and say, no, the couch doesn't differ from itself, even though I see it from different angles, is because in seeing it from those different angles, you were seeing it as one and the same couch staying the same throughout all of those, right? You, you saw it through a perspective, right? In the same way that the dog growing up is that dog, you know, from a particular angle, right? And that's, I, I mentioned the dog because that's the kind of example we used, especially when we were talking about the end of book five, uh, when we were talking about this idea that uh, beauty, the good and so on, though in themselves one, appear many in communion with bodies and actions and, and so on. Uh, so th the same thing is happening here, right? That uh, there is a thing that is one, the couch, whatever the object is of your perception, the reality, the real thing. Uh, but it always presents itself in, in a manifold way, like from this side, from that side, from that side. But you, in your perceptual experience, see the couch right? in the same way that you see a dog, in the same way that you see a circle or a beautiful thing in the drawing of a circle or the beautiful person, right? You know, the thing that came up a long time ago when I was talking about mimesis was that, you know, all of those um, experiential finite realities are ways of making present a, a deeper reality, like the reality of circle, that it is not itself a thing that can ever simply be present, but it's presented through things, right? So they, it's, it's like they allow it to speak through them. Right? And that's what he's, what he's showing you here is that that's exactly what happens within your perspective when you see anything. Right? Within the context of isthesis, within the context of perception, you are always seeing things from this angle, from that angle, from that angle, from that angle. But the, the sort of finite differentiated character of your perceptions doesn't mean that you're seeing a whole bunch of different things. No, on the contrary, those are so many different ways of you being able to see something that stays, you know, one and the same in itself. So that same relationship we were seeing before of mimesis, we see it also characterizes the very way that things appear to us, right? So it doesn't just characterize you know, the structure of things in reality, it also characterizes the very relationship between, you know, reality and the experience of it. Uh, so again, as I was saying before, like the, the, the discussion of the mirror really brought our attention to the nature of the perspective. And here now we're starting to 
turn into that and look at it. And then look at what he says about the painter now. He says, well, f f so first he's just asked Glaucon, uh, does it differ from itself or does it does it not differ at all? You know, right? And, and Glaucon says, um, the latter is so. Uh, it appears that way. It appears different. But then Socrates says, okay, now consider this point. Towards which is painting directed? Uh, towards the mimesis of being as it is or towards the phenomenon as it appears it, and so and and glaucon agrees it's it's um an imitation a mimesis of of looks of of uh, phantasms um so you know what is it that painting does well you know we, we were just saying that the very nature of aesthesis or of a perspective is that it's a kind of a mimesis right in that things appear to us and so our experience is kind of a reenactment of things analogously to the way that the mirror or the shadow reenacts things right i was saying we're kind of on the inside of that but now what is it that painting does it is a mimesis of a perspective it is a mimesis of the phenomena of the appearing. So it's a mimesis of a mimesis. It is the reenacting of experience, which was itself already a kind of reenacting. So what painting does is sort of show how things show themselves to us. Right? It, it shows how things are showing. Or you could say, you know, in our experience, things are able to be presented to us, right? And what painting does is present the presenting, the experience, by which things are able to be present. And what are those things that are present? Well, you know, if, if the thing you're experiencing is a dog, that organism out there was itself the way dog was being able to be made present, right? So there's a there's kind of a, a a chain of making present from the organism, which is making present a certain kind of reality, to the experience, which is making that organism present, to the painting, which is making that experience present, right? So there are a series of mimeses, and that last one, the painting is kind of the putting on display of the metaphysical slash epistemological structure that is inherent to that whole process. I said that painting is the portrayal of a perspective, and that's what I want to now pursue uh, a little bit further. Uh, and I want to begin with a remark that Socrates makes at uh, 602c. He says, The same magnitude surely doesn't look equal to our sight from near and from far. I uh, assume that's familiar enough. And uh, Glaucon agrees. And then he lists some more. He says, uh, Things look bent and straight when seen in water, etc., uh, etc. Et and then he says, And it's because they take advantage of this affection in our nature that shadow painting and puppeteering and other tricks of this kind fall nothing short of wizardry. Uh, it seems to me he's making actually there a very familiar point, and I want to pick up on that particular notion of things that uh, uh, don't look equal to our sight from near and from far. Right? When you see something that's far away, in a certain sense it looks small, even though it's actually big. Right? Whereas when it's up close, it looks big, um, even though it not, might not be that big. Uh, and painting relies on that to to portray things, right? Knowing that about our perception allows you to say, oh, if I want to make something look far, I'll make it smaller, right? So, uh, so that is the trick of basically perspective painting. That's something we especially associate, you know, with the painting of the European Renaissance. But it's also part of the the Greek tradition, right? The the we don't have much left of the ancient Greek painters except the stuff we have on vase paintings. We have lots of that. 
But, you know, there was a lot more going on with the Greek painters than that. And, and there may be a couple of representations of that or copies of it in Roman art. Uh, and especially there are some writings about it that let us know something about what these painters did, but we don't actually have that stuff to look at, which is too bad. But what does seem clear is that precisely this issue of the portrayal of perspective was alive in those painters. Um, there are you know, a handful of names. Some of the most famous ones are Chimon the painter, uh, Agatharchus, Apollodorus, Zeuxis. Uh, those are painters from probably somewhere around, I don't know, 600 B.C., uh, up to around the time of Socrates, who were the great innovators in painting. And they were especially dealing with exactly those things. Uh, uh, for example, this notion of foreshortening, which is the, the word we use to name how you portray something in a way as smaller to make it look farther or, or bigger to make it look closer. So, you know, think about this. If I just put my hand up here and I sit back like this, right? What you really see on the screen is a two is a two dimensional thing, a plane, a flat surface. But it looks like I'm behind my hand, right? And that's because the hand is here taking up so much space on the screen, right? Uh, you know, when I do that, it looks like my hand is a lot bigger than my head. In fact, my hand is a not, is not a lot bigger than my head. But you don't typically just say, oh, his hand is bigger than his head, you, you see the hand up close and the head far away, right? That is, that is sort of the, the big trick of perspective painting is um, showing things on a flat surface, on a two-dimensional surface, uh, at sizes that in, in a certain way aren't accurate. But what that sort of suggests to you, what that re sort of resonates with and reminds you of is the way things actually appear in depth, Right, that's the trick of painting. I think that's the wizardry he's talking about here. And indeed, he uses the language of shadow painting. That's the very word associated with the art of um, Apollodorus and, and I guess Zeuxis, uh, who you know you do similar things by the way you portray shadow in painting. I mean, of course, there are no real shadows in painting. There's just darkness on a surface. But but you use dark marks. Uh, to imply shadows and thereby to imply position, depth, illumination, and all the rest, right? Indeed, um, these themes of perspective and shadows and so on are at the heart of these Greek developments in painting, and there is so much of the uh, language of the Republic. Like, it is very sad that we don't have those paintings because there would obviously be a great sort of dialogue between what's said in this book and those realities, and we would learn a lot if we could compare them, but we don't have that. Nonetheless, you can get Socrates' point clear enough, uh, even, even without those details, just by knowing a little bit about what these painters did. So the point I want to get at here, then, is that the, the thing Socrates is saying here is that painting um, uses a kind of trick, you could say, uh, wizardry, right, that by, in a way, falsely portraying the size of things in a kind of literal sense, it is able to give you the uh, imitation of the experience of depth. So first of all, I want you to see that that is a description of the way painting works. But now he wants to make a point about that. And the point he makes about this is virtually identical to the point he made about the things he called the summoners uh, back in Book 7, which we talked about quite a bit. And the idea of the summoners w was that there are situations in which, um, in your everyday perception, you're presented with something that has, uh, in a certain way, contradictory attributes. And you might not notice them, but if you do notice them, it draws your attention to the fact that you're relying on sort of superior powers to be making sense of your experience. We have to be relying on, in, in the case of Book 7, he was talking about nukes, we have to be relying on sort of cognitive powers and insights that allow us to see in things uh, meanings that actually can't be adequately presented by those things. I'm not going to reproduce that whole conversation for you, but I want to remind you of it. Um, because he's saying here, that's what paintings do, right? And indeed, the, the parallels are very strong, down, down to the level of very specific bits of language, uh, including, for example, the language of the uh, faulos. Um, so... Here he talks about uh, the sort of low parts of the soul, or what Bloom translates as the ordinary parts. It's the same language that Socrates used back in Book 7 when he talked about the lowly business of 
uh, distinguishing one and two and three and so on. Uh, and so I encourage you to go and, and look at the st pretty strict paralleling of the language and the issues that are being raised here. And I mention that word too, just because here they contrast the better part of the soul with this worse part of the soul. And that language uh, corresponds also to a kind of cultural language. The, the aristocrats distinguishing themselves as the better people from those bad people. Uh, and uh, so I'm not going to pursue that here, but I want to alert you to sort of what's going on in the text. Uh, the point I want to make, though, is, is really just this, that the, the thing he's trying to bring out here is the way that painting, uh, you know, is a, as I was saying before, a portrayal of perspective. And it does that by, you know, what we call, you know, perspective painting. It does that, at least in part, by presenting you with something that's in a way f false or contradictory right like is the hand bigger than the head or smaller than the head well it's sort of both right if you were just to describe the uh, immediate flat surface you'd have to say the colors and shapes and so on that we're calling the hand are bigger than the colors and shapes and so on that we're calling the head but to see it as a painting, analogously to the way I talked about seeing a shadow as a shadow, you actually have to not see that. You actually have to see that the, the head, of course, is bigger than the hand, but it's just farther away. right? And so uh, to see a painting as a painting is to see something. Something is made available to you. Something is made present to you that actually contradicts what is sort of factually present in front of you right? but but when you see it as a painting you don't see just a distribution of lines and colors on a flat surface you see uh things people whatever in this case a, a man talking to you uh coming to life in front of you on the screen through those things right so you see through them to something that that they're reenacting uh, and so Socrates point here is that that noticing what the actual thing is that you're seeing this weird two-dimensional surface with these funny sizes and shapes of things and seeing the disparity between that and what you take yourself to be seeing that's what alerts you then to the fact that there's something more happening here than just uh, visual noticing of data or something like that right there are there are other powers in the soul that are being um called up painting portrays perspective and we talked about that at that sort of technical level right you're always seeing a couch from a side or on top or something that's part of what makes up a perspective and those kinds of things are what are then translated into paint by these tricks with size and shape and foreshortening and so on so so there we're looking at how a perspective is portrayed in those most sort of uh, abstract kind of structural elements right the fact that you see you have a binocular vision from a particular sort of vantage point and so on a very sort of um, physical version of perception right how depth is portrayed in two-dimensionality but portraying a perspective has a lot more to it than just that, right? Because your perspective isn't just that fact of your sort of physical spatial positioning as a viewer. Perspective is also how you see things. It's who you are, right? So your perspective is also, you know, your values and your memories and your history, right? All those things that shape how you see or, you know, how the world appears to you, right? And so that comes out again then much more clearly uh, uh, on the next page because Socrates gets into talking especially about uh, imitative or mimetic poetry tragic poetry and he asks what it is that's put on display and he says this at 603c um, imitation we say imitates human beings performing actions right that's what's really being put on display in tragic drama and lots of painting and other stuff too but especially he's talking about tragic drama human action is being put on display and and then he tells you a little bit about what's involved in human action he says human beings performing forced or voluntary actions and 
as a result of the actions, supposing themselves to have done well or badly, and in all of this experiencing pain and enjoyment, right? Those are the things that make up our perspective, right? First of all, as a who, as a someone, you're always acting. You're always doing stuff. There's no time when you're not, right? And your action is kind of, you know, the ongoing expression of who you are. But what what is that perspective that is being uh, expressed in your action? Well, you know, you're doing something forced or voluntary, uh, and then having done it, you have a view about yourself, whether you've done well or poorly, you know, you, so you assess that. And while all that's happening, you're either going to experience pain or enjoyment, right? Those three things, you know, the basic thesis of this, right? Like, did, is, is what you're doing a thing where you affirm this is the thing to be done? You know, that that would get, be the character, I think, of a voluntary action, something like that. Uh, but then in doing it, like, how, how do you... Uh, take account of yourself and think about what you've done both in terms of how well you've done at it but probably also whether you were right to do it or not and then you know what did it feel like what, what were the immediate kind of experiences of pleasure and pain that were happening while that was going on right those three things are roughly more than roughly those are uh, those are the three parts of the soul uh, that he distinguished uh, back in book four right that sort of cognitive thesis holding part of the soul that the thumoides, the spirited part, that's that's uh, how you esteem yourself, how you look for esteem in the eyes of others, right? And how you uh, take stock in uh, whether you think you're doing well. And then the sort of immediate pe pleasures and pains, right? Just the, the sort of uh, direct things you feel all the time you're going through that. Um, so for, you could check out that parallel. That would be certainly worthwhile. But the point I really want to make is just that he's here again bringing out the dimensions of a perspective right this this is what is going on in any action right? and so you know the painting in that sort of um mechanically manipulative way puts the perception of distance on display right uh and in that sense you know just at a basic level perspective is being portrayed but tragedy in portraying human action is also portraying perspective, right? It's portraying characters, where characters mean people with a character, right? People with an inside, with values and views and all the rest, right? What, what do you see in a Greek tragedy, right? You see uh, Antigone, for example, uh, with very strong views about the gods and about the way her brother has been mistreated. And, uh, you know, she's proud about what she's done or... You know, she would feel guilty if she didn't take action against him, and she endures certain kinds of discomfort and so on, right? All these things he says are exactly what is portrayed about Antigone, or Creon, or Ismene, or any other character in those plays. Um, and, of course, you know that to be true. If you think of any tragedy you've seen, whether we're talking about you know, a movie on TV or a Greek tragedy or whatever, uh, you, of course you know that what's portrayed is the the perspective of the person the action as a reflection of of human identity and, and what happens in the the uh, drama is you basically hear people you see people doing things and you hear them talking about it and and who they are is what you're shown you know as i said you could see it in tv but stick to the greek tragedy and, and think about those things and i think of course you would say that's what is put on display uh but now, now I want you to think about two things there. Uh, I want you to think about how the heck did that happen? How did uh, whatever uh, Sophocles did, writing in that script and then actors doing on stage, uh, how did that let you know these things about Antigone? Right? You can't you can't get inside Antigone. Right? You don't you don't somehow go in and inhabit her point of view, and yet that drama showed you those things um let's take a step back for a second outside of drama and think about action itself first right how do how do people themselves uh show you that thing right they act right when people act what they're doing is giving expression in a worldly way in hand movements and you know, opening doors and making sounds out of their mouths, right? You, you, you realize in worldly bodily fashion 
what was on your mind, what you thought was important, right? Your actions, the very meaning of your actions is that they are the expression of your perspective, right? But I say expression, I mean, that might be a good word for mimesis too, but, you know, what I really want to say here is reenactment, right? They, the, your actions are the way you enact or reenact your perspective, who you are, right? That's what you put out into the world through the things that you do. Uh, and, you know, you can do a better or worse job at that, right? You can certainly feel like um, the way you acted didn't really express your point of view that well or, or didn't measure up to what you thought it should be or something like that, right? The, the point I'm trying to get at there is that the actions are a different medium from the way you kind of live your inhabitation of a point of view. Uh, you, never, you are never not acting, but what's happening is that you, as a point of view, are constantly sort of translating yourself into another medium, which is the medium of worldly behavior, worldly affairs. And so, of course, what a tragedy does is it portrays human action, right? It, it takes the very way that people reenact themselves and uses that to show people. Right? Um, and so notice, again, I, mean, I already said this, but I want to underline it again. You are always involved in mimesis just by being. Because to be, you've got to do. And that doing is the ongoing imitation of yourself. Um, he said that, actually, back at 599... Uh, B, uh, in the context of a, you know, kind of a messed up conversation with Glocon, like all the rest. Uh, but he, he refer he's talking there about people who, um, who know how to do certain things. And he, and he says, um, if you really uh, knew how to do things, he says, uh, you'd be far more serious about the deeds than the imitations. And he says, and would try to leave many fair deeds behind as memorials of himself. Right. Uh, he said he's, you know, in the context of the conversation with Glaucon, he's trying to distinguish, you know, doing the real thing versus imitating it. But then the point that he makes says quite the opposite. Right. The point he makes is that acting is always a kind of imitating. Right. You the, the, he says the person who could really act will leave his fair deeds behind as memorials of himself, meaning that what you're always trying to do in your deeds is express what you stand for, what you are, right? You are constantly putting yourself on display or trying to put yourself on display in those things that you do. And for that reason, your actions are kind of the testament to who you are. But, you know, like all the other things we've talked about in that same sort of metaphysical context, they're never sufficient to unambiguously and unequivocally uh, sort of embody and realize who you are. Uh, your deeds can be taken in different ways, all, all kinds of things. But that's what we always are, right? As agents, we are imitators, self-imitators. To be an agent is to be uh, uh, essentially invested in the making of imitations, in reenacting who you are. Uh, and I want to then bring out one more point he makes about uh, perspective and, and these sorts of things too. And uh, this is at uh, 601D. And here he makes very a uh, very interesting point. He says, you know, there are certain kinds of things where to know them you have to use them. And and basically that means tools, right? The very things like couches and tables, you know, furnishings and implements that, that Glocom began talking about. Here uh, a particular point is really brought out about them that they, the very nature of those things is that they are for use. And consequently it is in use that they're that they assume their existence or their reality and that their meaning is really grasped and so he's talking about you know riding a horse here and he says you know yeah there can be somebody who makes reins and a bit and a saddle and so on but the the person who really knows what saddle and reins and bit are is the person who rides because that's what they're about they are about playing a functional role in the practice of uh handling a horse and you know navigating the train by so doing and so the person who really knows what those things are is is the person who uses them. And there's there's something um, 
about that that's inaccessible to someone else. Like if you haven't used them, you don't really know. Right? And that's a pretty pretty powerful point. And there are lots of things like that, right? That you actually have to do it to know what it is. And so the thing he's talking about here then is in the case of, you know, making rains or bits or whatever, uh, the perspective of the one who's actually a rider is the commanding perspective. That person may not know how to make reins for her or in Greek context himself. Uh, and of course, there's a kind of knowledge that the rain maker has that's absolutely essential. But the ultimate decisive thing is that experience of riding. Like that's that's the, where the ultimate judgment lies on like whether this thing was made right or not and indeed what it's for. And so there's something uh, absolutely inescapable and primary about the perspective of the user there. And so he says that person in, in Bloom's translation, that person has to give reports to the maker. Like the person has to take his or her own experience and knowing what it is figure out how to communicate to the maker what that person needs to know because that maker from his or her own perspective can't sufficiently see into the very reality they're trying to make to to know you know what to do so this person has to report on it uh i mean that seems like a straightforward point and, and an interesting one and and so on but i want to look at that word there for a minute uh the, the word that Bloom translates here is report. Uh, he says you're going to report. That's a, a ex angle. So you report. And he sometimes he calls you a reporter. That's a, an angle on, right? Um, uh, often we would see those words translated as a messenger, you know, give a message or so on. Uh, report is okay. But I want to remind you of another place where we saw that word. Uh, and in a actually remark, again, a remarkably similar context. Book 10 is stacked with resonances to the rest of the dialogue. It's it, it, virtually everything that's happened in the dialogue before comes up again here, and I'm not gonna unpack all of it, but you really have to read these things in light of the earlier conversations. And this conversation uh, seems to be corresponds very closely and directly to the conversation in book four, when uh, Socrates said, oh, you know, we were wondering what justice was, and then, you know, I caught sight of it. Uh, and he used that word, that verb I talked about, katharao. And then Glaucon said, Oh, you, you're bringing us good news, right? He says, "Eu uh, angeles," or, or you know, which which is literally our word evangelist. You are an evangelist. So, what does it mean in that case? There, you know, Socrates saw through something and had a kind of insight into the important thing. And Glaucon, you know, presumably hadn't had that insight, but Socrates is then saying, "Oh, I can tell you." what I saw that you haven't seen, but that you could see in this situation. Right? And so he's going to now try to say things that will allow the person who hasn't yet seen be able to change his perspective to see this, right? And so there, uh, being a messenger, literally being an angel, an angelos, uh, is communicating that vision to someone who can't yet see it, but it could see it. And the message isn't just, like this is where the word report is maybe a little bit, bit misleading. It's not just a factual presentation of something, right? It is, to use that same language again from book seven, it's a summons. It's like trying to talk to someone in such a way that they will be able to see something that they otherwise haven't been able to see because they haven't been occupying the experience where that thing is available. But what you're going to use is the kinds of language or words or deeds or whatever you have that belong to their world, but you're going to try to use those to allow them to shift into you know, kind of a different world, right? But, you know, that, and that's what summoners are. Like, that's what the painting is. The painting uses the disposition of the spatial disposition of color on a two-dimensional surface to let you see a three-dimensional space right to to let you go beyond seeing the disposition of color on a two-dimensional surface to seeing something else right to see through it to something else and that's what the character of a a, a message in this context is or a report right but so I want to bring out that passage there about the, 
this again this knowing through use because it it brings out again that notion of a perspective it brings out that notion of inhabiting a perspective and then as i was saying about action you know you're going to try to express that but there's a particular kind of expression which is the the attempt to summon someone to an experience they haven't yet had but they could have and i think that's what's captured by that notion of uh, uh, you are reporting uh, ex angles and so on. Um, so l let me use those things then as an attempt to talk about the portrayal of a perspective, both the resources used by painting or drama to portray a perspective, but also how perspectives are always portraying themselves. So you can see there is an intimate connection between perspective and portrayal or perspective and expression. You know, when I was talking about the mirror, I said, you know, there's something about reality that it's always sort of appearing and reflecting, right? Here, there's a related, somewhat different, but related point now about a perspective, right? That to have that perspective, to, to have something appearing to you can't be separated from the action of giving expression to that perspective, giving expression to what is appearing. Right? So with that in mind, I now want to move to the next topic, which is the portrayal of a good person. And so now I just want you to think about the good person, right? The behavior of the good person is always putting on display what it is to be good, right? It's always a mimesis of being good. Right? And that's why I think in this quite remarkable uh, passage from uh, 612c to 613b, uh, Socrates goes back and challenges the very premise of uh, Glaucon's thought experiment from way back in book two. He says, then will you give back to me what you borrowed in the argument? And Glaucon says, what, what in particular? And he says, I gave you the just man's seeming to be unjust and the unjust man seeming to be just and then he says a little bit further on uh give this back right i uh i want you to acknowledge that it doesn't escape the notice of the gods at least what each of the two men is uh so uh he's saying basically the, the very thing we've been saying about action etc etc and, and imitation means that good person the good is always showing itself i mean i guess we saw, saw that about the good in general back in book six that the good is precisely that which is always showing itself just just in being right but here the good person a moral character necessarily is always putting itself on display so the good person is always showing what it is to be good but of course like everything else we've said uh, those showings are ambiguous, right? So they put they put the good into terms that don't by themselves carry sufficient force to make it be the case that you would recognize the good in them, right? So the portrayals uh, of good action by the good, the actions of the good, are always a kind of summons to you to be able to see them as good, right? To adopt that perspective uh, such that uh, you can see what the good is, right? They, they are, in that sense, we said reports, right? The, the, the ways a message is being brought down to you of, of something you should recognize. But then also, you know, he says uh, at 604E, uh, he's talking about imitation of characters in tragic drama, and he says, uh, the irritable disposition affords much and varied imitation, while the prudent and quiet character, which is always nearly equal to itself, is neither easily imitated nor, when imitated, easily understood, especially by a festive assembly where all sorts of human beings are gathered in a, the in a theater. For the imitation is of a condition that is surely alien to them. Uh, uh, the, the point I want to bring out of that is that... Uh, yeah, you do have to have a certain kind 
of character. You have to be good, or at least, you know, wanting to be good, to be able to recognize the good when it's put on display. And, you know, he says it's not easily imitated. And I wonder if the reason for that is because uh, good action, you know, requires judgment. It requires responsiveness. And so there's not just a single thing that stands as the imitation of the good, right? You know, going back again to book five, where we had this idea that the, the realization of the just thing will be both just and unjust. The realization of the good thing will be both good and bad, right? What that sort of shows is that in, in you know, real contexts, there's no perfect answer to the question, what is the just act or the, the, the good act? And so doing the good will require you to make a kind of perspectival judgment on a kind of a perspectival situation, right? And so there isn't a single thing that is always the good thing to do or the just thing to do. So perhaps that's the reason it's not easily imitated, right? That you can never really recognize the good if you're not attuned to the unique way that action is responsive to the unique specificities of its situation. But but so that makes it not easily imitated, but it also means that, you know, because, you know, going back to that point about you have to, you know, be a rider of a horse to know what reins are, right? you have to be the you in the user's perspective to really grasp the thing. Well, similarly here, you know, you, you really have to be in the perspective of recognizing the good to see a good action as a good action. You have to be a good person to be able to recognize the good for what it is, right? And so again, uh, it's it's something that isn't easily recognized by someone who is not him or her themselves, you know, trying to be a good person. And then even more so, you know, remember again in book uh, six, he talked about those kinds of things that a crowd isn't well suited to recognize. And, and I, I think the same point is being made again here, right, that recognizing the good is a kind of personal transformation you have to make it's not the kind of thing a crowd can do right and so the the portrayal of the good in a character is recognizable but it's recognizable by someone only under certain circumstances you have to sort of be trying to be good uh, you have to be, you know, intelligently responsive to the relationship between that action and its situation. And you have to make that response singly, right? You can't just want to be part of the crowd. Um, but so let's just think a little bit more then about that particular nature of that portrayal, right? One of the things he says also uh, at 605 uh, C to D he says one of the things that's really uh, interesting about dramatic portrayals is that they conjure up in us a kind of sympathy. Right? So he says, uh, when even the best of us hear Homer or any other of the tragic poets imitating one of the heroes in mourning or making quite an extended speech with lamentation, or if you like singing and beating his breast, you know that we enjoy it and that we give ourselves over to following the imitation suffering along with the hero in all seriousness we praise as a good poet the man who most puts us in the state right well so the point i want to make there is then that then part of the power of art or at least tragic drama but presumably all of the arts is that they encourage us to follow along with what they're portraying lots of ways in which that can be not good, right? That's how advertising works. It uh, sucks you into a certain kind of perspective, you know, so that you're going to buy something or so that you're going to dislike something, or right? that's how propaganda works. But that's that advertising or propagandistic uh, use is a kind of exploitation of a power integral to the artistic presentation, right? That it's the nature of art, that it, it's a kind of invitation. You know, I said before, it's a summons, which is right, but another another uh, angle on that is to think of it as an invitation. It sort of invites you into something, and draws you in. And specifically, what it draws you into is uh, sympathy, sympasco, right? To, to suffer along with the thing, to feel along with it, or compassion. And so the thing about the artwork then 
is that it has the capacity to kind of draw you in in your non-reflective emotional life into the relevant experience, and in this case, into the experience of the good person. So it has a particular power and a particularly interesting one. Right? The thing he's talking about here is the way that uh, the power of art can kind of sneak behind the walls you've officially built up, right? Like if, if uh, your parents or the laws of the city or whatever, just social mores in general have built up in you a view that you should behave a certain way or whatever, you know, you will be careful to behave that way in public and uh, you'll try to put on a good, a good face and so on. And you'll try to uphold those things. Uh, although, as he says, you know, often when we're in private, when we're sort of uh, been, been deserted by all the other people, we will put on display feelings that we wouldn't put on a, on public. And there, uh, the situation of going into isolation such that the truth comes out is very much like the point he made about taking the slaveholder and putting him in a desert uh, and letting the truth come out about his relationship to the slaves. Now, something similar happens here. But anyway, so we have feelings inside us or possibilities inside us, which we try to hold back by rules. Now, that can take two forms, right? We can have you know, bad feelings or bad attitudes, and those rules could be good. So maybe we haven't fully assimilated those rules. And that means, you know, we still have a kind of imperfect character. And the nastiness in us will show up if, uh, if we're set free of having to put up a good face, right? And so that's a way that uh, propagandistic art and so on can, can be bad, right? It can encourage us to give voice to give space to those those things in us that we really shouldn't be feeling but that we haven't really uh, got proper control of but it also has the other side right what if the rules set up in you are not so good right in that case art has the possibility of releasing a good in you that's being held down by a poor regime and again so if we think of glaucon or indeed if we think of that exact example of you know the slaveholder uh being taken out into the desert and the truth of his relationship to the slaves being revealed right the the point socrates made there and at a similar point in book five was that the the idea that it's okay to have slaves is something that can only be maintained because your neighbors in the society hold forward that view too right and so they both convince you of its plausibility by its habitual acceptance and they're there to provide the force to keep the slaves down right and to make sure you can maintain that position right and so one of the things that came up in book five was whether glaucon was going to be able to recognize a kind of incoherence in his views about slavery in relationship to the nature of anthropos the nature of the human being uh so uh, uh, and maybe he wouldn't because the social system is so powerful, it's kind of hard to believe in uh, something that, you know, only you're feeling when the rest of the society says something else. Well, that's an example of, a, you know, the possibility of a kind of good thing inside you that's being held down by uh, bad rules and bad structures. Well, then that's, again a thing that the uh, sympathia of uh, tragic drama or the arts can make possible. It can make possible you feeling sympathy with people and with situations in a way that sneaks outside the guardians in your soul that are trying to hold you to uh, a problematic, an oppressive uh, perspective. But so the real question then about... Uh, the good person and the the uh how a good person seems is really can you see it when when it's put in front of you right and so again remember the story of achilles uh back in book three at the very beginning of book three socrates and adamantus talked about the story of achilles in the underworld saying you know he'd rather come back kind of as a an ordinary man rather than to to be the person he had been and they uh, talk about getting rid of that story because, well, maybe it sounds like he's being afraid of death. 
But the point I made when we talked about the story of the cave in book seven is that uh, story of Achilles actually puts on display one of the most important experiences of the good person. And if you understand the drama, the psychological drama portrayed in the cave, you can see that it's one of the essential perspectives of that situation that that story puts on display. But so confronted with that story, confronted with a, a good perspective being imitated, being, being exhibited, uh, Adamantus didn't recognize it, right? And so that's kind of the question. Can you recognize it, right? The reason he didn't recognize it there was because of those, uh, those aristocratic values, those soldier male values that come out of that society of honor and so on that it seems to me Adamantus and Glaucon both pretty broadly adhere to, right? So the thing is, what, what Socrates' analysis and that story of Homer really say is that if you've embraced the regime that sort of aristocratic regime of honor you can't recognize a good person a good man when you see him and indeed then that's a question that socrates has been asking glaucon you know repeatedly throughout this right can you judge a person when you see him uh and with that in mind now i want to turn just to the last part of the of book 10 uh, the so-called myth of Ur. So the story of Ur is a colorful tale uh, about a fellow Ur who, you know, apparently dies on the battlefield and then comes back to life. Uh, and when he comes back, you know, he tells you what he saw in the in the world of death. That should remind you of two pretty striking things, right? Uh, first of all, you know, the, the um, Republic began with Socrates describing a uh, catavasis, right? I went down, catavane, right? And that's the language uh, for, you know, trips to the underworld, right? The, the famous, most famous one in this context being Odysseus going down to the underworld to talk with the shades of dead heroes, uh, in which context, for example, he talks to Achilles, uh, and Achilles, you know, says something that uh, that uh, Adamantus uh, wants to excise from the from the tradition. Uh, so, the on the one hand, the story of Ur is like those other traditional stories of travels to the underworld. Uh, the other thing it should remind you of uh, is precisely the story of the cave in book seven because that's the story of the story of the cave is the story about someone you know who goes out and sees the light and comes back down to see all the people who are who are trapped in that underworld which is us uh, and uh, brings them uh, a story of what, what reality is like compared to what they see and uh, is not believed uh, but uh, so so you should see the parallel of the story of Ur with both the sort of framing of the Republic as a whole and with that uh, centerpiece of the Republic the story of the cave and see that Ur fits in that very particular role uh, that that we saw was pretty important uh, and so if you again think of the cave you know there the person who comes back is is sort of bringing the story of like what what things are really like right and that's more or less what Ur has to do here and I want to note the particular language right at 614 D uh, it says you know Ur, Ur went up to the guys passing judgment and you know uh, when he came forward they said that he had to become a messenger to human beings of the things there and that word messenger is, is angelos the very one I was just talking about right so the language here really describes exactly that thing you know about being a messenger of the good and so on uh so now what is the story he tells well his story is a story of the judgment of lives right and, and really that's what there is there is you know the place where lives are judged so that story then you know also then should remind you of uh, a couple of other things it should remind you of the stories that 
Adamantus began by criticizing. Right in the beginning of book two, Adamantus complained about the stories about you know rewards and punishments in the afterlife, and it was Adamantus's complaints about that that provided the sort of context and structure for that very big discussion of the education of the guardians in uh, books, uh, the end of book two, and then throughout book three and and part of book four, uh, where they talked about the nature of poetry and so on. Uh, and uh, and those stories about what happens in the afterlife were also the ones that came up at the very beginning of the Republic uh, with Cephalus. And in fact, Cephalus, you might recall, uh, was a little frightened of them. Cephalus said, uh, when a man comes near to the realization that he will be making an end, i.e. dying, fear and care enter him for things to which he gave no thought before. The tales told about what is in Hades that the one who has done unjust deeds here must pay the penalty there, at which he laughed up until then, now make his soul twist and turn because he fears they might be true. You know, that issue of how Cephalus relates to that, it seems to me, is pretty uh, central for understanding, you know, what's happening here at the end of the book. Uh, anyway, so what does Adamantus say? Well, Adamantus says a particular thing in, in um, book two, uh, he says, you know, he's complaining about these stories, and he says, um, he, uh, he quotes a few different things, but then he says um, about Musaeus and his son talking about the, you know, rewards for just people. He says, uh, in their speech, they lead them into Hades and lay them down on couches. Crowning them, they prepare a symposium of the holy, and they then make them go through the rest of time drunk in the belief that the finest wage of virtue is an eternal drunk. Uh and in turn, they bury the unholy and unjust in mud in Hades and compel them to carry water in a sieve. Um, uh, so I want to take that second one first. Uh, they compel them to carry water in a sieve. Yeah, I mean, you know, surely we've heard those stories about, uh, you know, the sort of punishments in Hades. And those are the things that Cephalus is concerned about because he is unjust. And so he's concerned about the price he's going to pay for being, being unjust. Um, you know, it's portrayed as a story about something that might happen to you later, and that's obviously how Cephalus conceives of that. But it seems to me Socrates has made a point of showing us that that story is not about something that's going to happen some other time. That's, that's a story about, about, you know, who you are. And so, you know, remember the, the story about the tyrant was that the very nature of that sort of most unjust person was that his desires are insatiable. And so this person who's been trying to get what he thinks is the most successful life has really produced the most failing life because he can never get what he wants, right? So that notion that the uh, desires of the tyrant are insatiable is the same as saying he's got to carry water in a sieve, right? There's nothing he can do to get water in his pot. Any water he puts in just pours right out again. He's got to be refilling it again and again and again and again and again. So it seems to me that Socrates in Book 9 has sh pretty much shown you what, what you probably could have figured out any, anyway if you had a, a little bit more uh, realistic relationship to those kinds of stories. Uh, what Socrates has shown is that those stories aren't telling you about something else. They're telling you about what your reality is. right? And so... The, the point is, I suppose you could say, vice is its own punishment, right? The, the, there's not something else that's going to have to happen to you to make it turn out that this was a bad way to live and that you're going to be punished. You're living the worst life. And that's what their account uh, presumably has proved, right, by, by the end of Book 9, if not earlier. Um, but so let's think about the other side for a second. Uh, Adamantus says... You know, that story portrays, you know, the reward for the just life as an eternal drunk. Like, on the one hand, you might think, hmm, sounds like the same thing, right? That, you know, if, if sort of that's what the tyrant wants, I just want to be drunk all the time, you know? Uh, and in, I think in a certain way that's right, right, that you could say that's a, to hold on to that goal, I think that the greatest reward is going to be to be drunk all the time, uh, is 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 kind of a an empty way to think, and you're really imagining something that's more like eternal punishment. But but there's another side to that too, right? Remember that, you know, we've been talking all along about 
things that are both good and bad, you know, realities that are both good and bad, stories that are ambivalent and so on. And, you know, I think a story that talks about the reward for being just as kind of an eternal drunk, similarly, uh, similarly can be understood a little differently, right? And so if you think of the point Socrates has been trying to make uh, throughout, you know, let's say book six and book seven, you know, he's been trying to show you there that justice is its own reward, just as injustice is its own punishment. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to look for somewhere else to it, right? And so the idea that the reward for justice is an eternal drunk uh, more or less means, I think, that uh, it's, the, the just person is happy. There's, 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 you don't have to say much more than that. Um, so so why, why use that image? Well, remember the very thing, again, that we've been talking about. Uh, the good, or, you know, um, as it comes up in the story of Ur, the truth of things there, right? We've said that that's something, that we're, that's a reality that can't ever simply be present. So the issue of being a messenger of things there is that you have to present something that in a certain way is unpresentable, that in a certain way can't be made present, right? You, you have to present something in a way that, exhorts someone to do the relevant thing in themselves to to get the point of what you're saying and see it on their own but you can't just hand them the thing right and so you know we were just talking about artworks and you know how how those images work right so it seems to me you can think about even just use, taking what adamantus said right you can take that opposition of the eternal drunk and the sieve you know, does, it can provoke you to a lot of thought right it can provoke you to a lot of thought precisely because you know, if the things that were said in, in Book 9 are true, you might think, man, this look the same. The eternal drunken living in a sieve, that, that might be the same thing. Uh, that uh, apparent contradiction, I suppose, of the best and the worst being united might be a kind of a summoner, might be something that provokes you to think about, like, what's really being said here? right? And, and I think you can figure it out. Uh, anyway, it seems to me that point I was just making about um, uh, about the sense in which the reward for the just life is an eternal drunk. Uh, it seems to me that's kind of what the story of her really is about. You know, the, the story is basically about how people die, they, they get some sort of rewards or punishments or whatever, and that's the thing they live through. Like you gotta, you gotta. These are stories about things that are ongoingly happening, and then it turns out you're gonna be judged again. Like it's a, it's an ongoing cycle. And so the story ends up being about how you choose a life, right? Uh, and and it seems to me that's that's really what the what the point is. The real thing that judgment is about is you choosing a life, and that's a thing that's a thing you do in your life. You are choosing who you're going to be, you know. And that's an issue, you know, from the very beginning, you know, back in book one. Uh, uh, Socrates was saying to Thrasymachus, like, don't you realize that the thing you're talking about, which is really choosing a life, is the biggest issue. Uh, he says that here, right? That's the greatest issue for a life, right? The, the biggest thing people have to do. And throughout, uh, we have been grappling with that issue of, you know, what you would choose. You know, so for example, in uh, books eight and nine, Socrates portrayed some lives, the life of the man of honor, the life of the man of money, the life of the man of freedom, right? The life of the tyrant, right? The man of desire, I guess. Uh, and uh, at the end of that, you know, he asked uh, Glaucon, you know, so which do you choose? And, and this whole context was, as I was saying before, from book two, Glaucon having to make a choice about his own path, about his own life. And that's what Socrates has been focusing on. So uh, th I want you just to, to think about that idea that choosing a life is kind of what life is about. And that's really what's put on display in this story. This is the story about people choosing a life. Uh, and, and Socrates' story, um, you know, sort of says, well, lives have various characteristics, right? You're going to find yourself, you know, like you could be poor you could be rich you could be this you could be that but the particular thing he says is that when the when the souls you know after death or whatever are given some options and they have to choose their the life they're going to have he says 
an ordering of the soul was not in them due to the necessity that a soul become different according to the life it chooses. Uh, and it seems to me we know about that. That's, that's kind of what the whole book has been about, right? That you're going to be confronted with things and you you actually have to choose well how to deal with the with the situation that you have um and you are ongoingly going to be choosing who you are like like, yeah maybe you're going to decide like oh i'm going to be a teacher or i'm going to be something like that that's choice of a life in one sense you're picking a kind of model. Are you going to be a sophist? Are you going to be a scientist? Are you going to be this or that? Whatever, right? Uh, but then you are ongoingly going to be choosing who you are in the way you live that out, right? And so, again, at 613 uh, B and C, uh, he gave the example of someone running a race. He said, you know, some people start off fast, but they, you know, it's a bad choice for running the race as a whole and that means they 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 have to get to the end and they suffer because they're they're slow at the end whereas somebody who chose uh, more wisely paced themselves and they can finish stronger you know that's a very very much a story about bodily conditioning and so on but the but the point it makes is that those choices you make are not indifferent they the thing you do now is shaping who you are then and so that's a, that's a really uh, powerful kind of image, I think, for the weight of choice. The choices uh, aren't just things that come and go. They they shape you. And so that's what Socrates says in this story, right? The, the ordering of the soul is not given when you say, I'm going to be a father. Uh, the issue is going to be how you take that up. Uh, so, so, you know, think then about what what it's like to live a life or to choose a life right in, in living a life it's you it's like that story of the stargazing pilot basically uh from book six right? you're you're on a trip it's like you're sailing a boat and you know you really need to do what that stargazing pilot does right right which is that guy turns to the this huge spinning top the image from book four this huge spinning top that is the heavens, right, which is what comes up at the beginning of the story of Ur, this huge spinning top that is the heavens, that's the thing, that's that's the way the world around you uh, testifies to the intrinsic ordering of reality. And a person who's going to be a good pilot of the ship knows that he has to uh, guide his sailing by the order of reality that's put on display in the positions of the stars and the planets and whatever. Uh, and again, that, that spinning top of reality, the heavens, they don't care about your trip. Like it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't figure on that scale. Right? Which is, uh, again, similarly to the point here that says, you know, compared to the eternity of time, like the time of life doesn't, doesn't even measure up. Right? Uh, so that you know that that uh, the heavens that are revolving around the spindle of necessity, uh, they they are that that in a fundamental way dictates the terms we have to answer to, and there's something fundamentally naive about those sailors in Book Six who deny the the necessity to answer to necessity, right? Deny the need for the pilot to guide the ship by looking at the stars. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to sail your boat well, you have to answer to the terms of reality. But the, but the, the dimensions of reality that are expressed and realized in the movements of the planets, right, and in the positions of the stars and so on, uh, those are the realities of those are geometrical realities right those are the rules of line and circle right those those are the things you know they're part of the structure of reality but they're you know if you think back to the divided line like they're not the highest level for your life for your trip your sailing of the boat the, the thing the, the thing that is living a human life the thing that isn't taken account of in the spinning of the heavens right for that you have to answer to the higher orders of the line you have to answer to beauty the good analogously to the way that 
moving bodies are intrinsically answerable to the necessities of line and circle and so on. Uh, the soul is intrinsically answerable to the call of the good and the beautiful. Uh, or, or as he says here, you know, we're akin to it. Uh, but, you know, you remember all along from the, from the very first pages, we've been distinguishing, you know, compulsion and persuasion, uh, you know, necessity and freedom, something like that. Well, things like the good and the beautiful, uh, those are things that uh, don't just push you around like line pushes a body around. I mean, those are things that uh, require you to turn and be persuaded by them. Right? The rule of the good and the rule of the beautiful really only happens in a world, in a life, in which you have lent your support to it. So yeah, you need to be like the stargazing pilot, uh, but not exactly gaze at the stars. You need to recognize the good. But now again, remember the point we made before, like as Socrates again said at 612d, uh, you know, justice does not deceive those who really take possession of it. Right? The thing is, when you do turn and when you are persuaded by the good, you haven't been persuaded in the sense of being talked into something by someone external. You've seen the light in the uh, image of, uh, in, in the terms of the image of the cave, right? And so, um, uh, justice does not deceive those who really take possession of it. Yeah, like when you, when you recognize the good, you're not looking for something else to prove to you that that's the right thing, right? The, the, the. Uh, recognition of the good doesn't need something else to justify it, right? And so that then brings us back to that issue with uh, Cephalus and these stories of the afterlife. You know, he's worried about what punishment he's going to get uh, for being unjust, right? So, so he is doesn't see he doesn't he doesn't own his own choices, right? He doesn't see his life just as the choices he's made he's hoping that something else is gonna i suppose settle his accounts for him so to speak um when you are just you're not looking for a reward in the afterlife when you're just there, there isn't something else that could justify it that's the very nature of recognizing the good the good is its own reward justice is its own reward so, you know, uh, in, in the story of Ur, you know, there's these people who, he says, you know, have, have you know, habitually done the things that are called just, but they don't really, they, they don't really have the virtue of justice. They haven't really recognized it, right? And so when they're offered the chance to choose a life, like, they really actually show their true colors and choose tyranny. They're, they're bad people. So, that you know, that's, that's um, in a way, like... Uh, looking for, you know, external rewards and so on. Whereas, you know, uh, unlike those people or unlike Cephalus, you know, what Socrates has been trying to say is that, you know, you don't, uh, you don't need external rewards. Uh, and that's exactly then what happens in the story of Odysseus in this, in this book, right? Odysseus doesn't want any kind of fancy life. He chooses the life of an ordinary person. Uh, uh, and and again, that should remind you of that ongoing language of the 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 better and the worse, the Beltistan or the um, Ariston versus the the Faulon, right? Uh, that came up uh, talking about the summoners, and then I you know I talked about it as the sorts of people that are portrayed in comedy, right? There's been this ongoing issue about the sort of aristocrats who think of themselves as the good, and then the sort of ordinary or low people, and that, that you know that has been being played off. And I've been trying to emphasize throughout the, the way that Socrates is, um, in, a, in significant ways, kind of defending the, the, uh, the low uh, against those people who presume themselves to be good. Uh, and so, you know, this story is pretty striking, right? Uh, Odysseus chooses the life of a low person, an ordinary person. The point being, there are no special trappings that 
one should be seeking for because that's not where the good comes from. And indeed, had Odysseus been given the chance, you know, Odysseus cho chooses that because he comes a little bit late in the selection process, but had he been allowed to choose first, he would have chosen the same thing. Um, so that story about Odysseus, it seems to me, kind of caps this whole thing off, right? That it's it's really about the idea that uh, there is there are not rewards for the soul beyond being good, being just. And it's striking then that that story about Odysseus, what, what Odysseus does in the underworld is choose the life of an ordinary person, which is remarkably exactly what Achilles said to Odysseus that he would do if he could do it all over again. If he had another chance to choose a life, that's what he would do. Uh, and again, that's the story that uh, Adamantus wanted to remove, and that's the story that Socrates invoked at the point in the story of the cave when someone came down as kind of a messenger from what was there. Right? So, uh, so again, I think you see this story of Odysseus uh, kind of choosing an ordinary life kind of uh, ties up the book as a whole. Right? That there's not some other there that you're trying to get to. Uh, the there is is right here, and this is this is where the good is going to happen. Right? This is where final judgment is happening. Uh, and then that relates just to to wrap that up. That relates to Socrates' remark then at six thirteen a, where he says, in the case of the just man, if he falls into poverty, diseases, or any of the other things that seem bad, for him it will end in some good, right? Uh, so again, first of all, that notion of for him just reminds you of the theme of perspective that I've been trying to emphasize for a while. But but the point is, these things are not um, goods or bads in themselves. These, these are uh, the context in which you will choose your life, the context in which you will be someone. And for the good person... There are occasions for being good, right? Uh, and that's, again, why Socrates says, you know, in that line from the Apology, you can't, you can't harm a good man. Goods and bads for the soul aren't things that come at it from outside. There's a good intrinsic to the soul and there's a bad intrinsic to the soul. The bad for the soul is vice. Good for the soul is virtue. And... Uh, circumstances that that are your lot in life uh, are the occasion for you to realize the good or indeed to fail to do it. Mm -hmm.